Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. I'm one of the consultants reproductive medicine surgery and assisted conception. And today I want to talk to you about quite an interesting case. And I think there are two interesting cases which are very much clinically oriented and come up with very fundamentally basic questions which we have to answer. The first one is looking at a very simple concept if, is how to lower LH levels and this is about a case of polycystic ovarian syndrome and whether we can re reduce the LH levels or not. And the entire discussion goes towards how do we decrease LH levels and, and what do they signify and that is something which I will be telling you about. The second case which will come in the next week or so will be a case of the trigger and whether the LH loop, the hypothalamic pituitary axis loop, remains intact or gets affected by the HCG trigger. And I think these two topics we'll be talking to you about. So now let's look at this. This was a case sent to me and it's quite an interesting case. A 28 year old lady uh, with a known case of polycystic ovarian syndrome, an AMH of 7.3 nanogram per liter. She was given the oral contraceptive pill for 42 days and I believe this was done to lower the LH levels. In, in effect it would mean to down regulate and lower the LH levels and that's what a pill does. The pill will lower the LH levels. But what happens since then? And the LH comes back as 10.9 the FSH goes down is about 4.9, the E2 is 62.9. So at that stage, the doctor plans and, and gives a combination, and I believe it would be a low dose therapy, and gives a combination of letrozole and gonadotrophins, and there's no follicular growth. And I think that is something which is quite an interesting situation. And all of us reach that situation. You know, we see these polycystic ovarian cases which are quite dense, they have a lot of, lot of stroma, there's a lot of theca cell element, there are small follicles, there's a high AMH and then almost all the stimulations tend to fail. Now the question is asked is you know, why is the LH still low and uh, can we do something to get it lower? Uh, now let me go down to the basics. I'm not, I very rarely use the pill to lower the LH levels. Now, if you want to significantly lower the LH levels, the only way you can do it is to, is to down-regulate using uh, analogs and have caused profound suppression of the pituitary. But that, frankly, is dangerous. And it's dangerous mainly because you then are left with no options on the trigger if she, this lady, uh, you know, overstimulates. And, and that is something which I believe we, we need to have a, a serious think of. And my question is, why are you looking at lowering the LH? Now, I don't know, I believe there are a lot of people who are fixated with this idea that we have to lower the LH. Now, the LH tells us a very important story. It tells us a story of the theca cell element. Now, in, in effect, can you really lower the theca cell element? You can lower, lower the pituitary response to it, but that means nothing. The ovary does not change a dramatic shape unless you put her on the pill for months and months and months and the, and the ovary just does not do anything like that. So you're giving the pill for a very short period and during that short period you're not going to change the structure of the ovary. Second, it, this is a very high AMH and we know from studies that if you want to lower AMH and in fact if you want to successfully stimulate any ovary then the AMH level has to be lowered and that, that is the concept. Now you'll start you may start wondering what it is, but that is the basic concept. Your follicle has to break the inhibitory, inhibitory force that AMH comes up with. So, number one here, you have somebody who's got a very large ovary, possibly. She's got a very high LH and she's got a very high AMH. And I, I, I will tell you right in the beginning that this ovary is being, going to be very difficult to stimulate and it's going to be incredibly difficult to stimulate this ovary. And she's been on metformin and minus at all and all those and I think there's, a, there's an element to it and I think if you see my, the talk of my colleague Sachin Kulkarni on this forum and he aptly put it and there is some role in giving metformin but how effective it is I just don't know. 
Now, what do you do in the stimulation? And the questions asked is, how do you stimulate this ovary? And, uh, you know, should we go towards IVF? And I, I will pro probably give you an idea. And I, I will give you an idea on a, a slightly different format. And I, 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 I do have this unique triangle, but I have also a slightly ridiculous slope. And I, I call it ridiculous because it is giving me an idea of which ovary may... Um, uh, you know, stimulate and which don't. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying I've got a very clear idea on it. I'm still working on it. And I'm working on, uh, 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 you know, what stimulation in a PCO, not in, uh, just in a poor responder. And I'm doing two techniques in, in a PCO and in a poor responder, the combination of AMH and the antral follicle count and how the slope comes up. And now let me just show you an idea of this. Now, now let's uh, look at two concepts. One is, I've explained this triangle and I quite uh, lovingly call it the goody triangle and what are we looking at? We're looking at an ovary and you're looking at I place a triangle in the ovary and it is for simplification I make this. Patients find it very difficult to understand and you're looking at multiple follicles and these are the follicles you can see. Well these are small follicles that you can't see. So what is effective stimulation and what is effective uh, effective induction and I think it is a unique principle of physics that comes in here that there is a resistance that comes down and, and that resistance is LH and AMH and these are the indicators and the ovarian volume and what you want to know is the size of the follicle and all these are markers of resistance and you know as you start looking into my way of thinking, probably, I'm not saying it's all entirely correct, but I'm coming to a certain conclusion where I'm saying, well, what are we up against? We are up against an ovary, which is effectively difficult to stimulate. And it's difficult to stimulate for multiple reasons. It's difficult to stimulate because the LH is high and the LH is the theca element that goes inside. It is effective because the AMH is high and this acts as an inhibitory force and your size of follicles, the smaller the size of follicles, the inhibitory nature of the AMH as well as the LH, in fact, does not allow the follicle to grow. And what breaks that threshold? There's only one thing that breaks that threshold, which means what breaks that resistance. And that resistance is broken by just one thing, and that is FSH. So what you're doing is you're trying to, in induction, you're trying to balance of breaking the threshold of one follicle. In stimulation, you're trying to break the threshold of multiple follicles. So, so here again, where does my slope come in? And th that's a slightly new concept. So uh, believe me, that concept will be changing as I get my head around it and I, and I start thinking about it. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at a slope. And what is a slope demonstrating you with? It demonstrates AMH follicles and LH and the higher the slope goes and I'm giving some numbers to it and I'll come back to you in a, in a couple of months and I'll show you what those numbers mean and it tells us the higher the slope goes your follicles are going to find it much difficult to climb this path and they're literally climbing that path so when they're climbing that path what effectively happens is that your amount of FSH is limited so again if you're going to break the threshold, what are you going to do? So effectively, what you're going to do here, and I think, let's like have a look at it this way. I would not suppress her LH, and it's difficult. There's only one way that you can effectively suppress LH without giving her medicines, and uh, that is why ovarian drilling. And I think this case may. Uh, they, they, I, you, you could win the argument by saying, let's drill the ovaries, and then let's give her clomiphene or uh, letrozole. It's number two, and I would say before you try out, use either extended clomiphene or use extended letrozole. Both these allowing for prolonging the recruitment window, and you can use both of them. Second, you could either try stair strip of uh, protocol of clomiphene or stair strip protocol of letrozole. Both again effectively work in some cases of polycystic ovaries. If low dose gonadotropin does not work, and sometimes it may take you 21 days. And this effectively increases the 
cost and as well as the frustration a patient and a doctor face. And I would say give those two options, but I, I, my general feeling is looking at the image and looking at what responses occur, this, these may fail, but these may be a cheaper option of trying it. Clomiphene ha, tends to have a cumulative effect and has a half-life, I think is about five days. So it's going to be a, a bit longer. Now, the, with IVF, I think it's more challenging. And I, and I think if you use the normal protocol, and I, I, I will be lecturing on this, I think I'm uh, at one of the meetings uh, I'm doing as well as in the course that I run uh, on effectively seeing how much it, you can stimulate. And here, I think you should be, you'll only be able to work with a step down protocol and a step down protocol probably trying to use HMG rather than recombinant FSH and trying to limit the number of small follicles growing. But this is going to be a challenge for you. And I would suggest that before you move on to the, uh, these two cases, I, I, I would say either try prolong those of clomiphene going up to almost 10 to 15 days and you'll see some of these ovaries working or even letrozole and I, I feel that it's, it's a great, it is worthwhile trying letrozole first. The second thing about letrozole is and I, I, I can understand the core uh, way letrozole works and you, you need to have an effective aromatase inhibition so you need to drop the uh, uh, E2 quite dramatically to have a rebound surge of FSH and you see the rebound surge of FSH is effective by increasing the lows of letrozole. So what I've done sometimes, I think it's worth trying it out. See, there, there are no fixated final answers for difficult cases. And if somebody tells you that's what you do, I think I'll say, hang on guy, uh, that, that could be a, a bit question mark because medicine varies from patient to patient. And what I've done often is I've given letrozole 7.5 or 10 milligram a day and continued that for 14 days. And I've seen some women break their FSH threshold and produce two or three follicles. And that's fantastic. And I think it's worth giving that a try. Something controversial, but something worth doing that. I'm not a great lover of Clomid because if you look at the uh, evidence on Clomid and prolonged Clomid, the endometrium drops even when there is no endometrial effect. So I think letrozole does have those benefits and if you combine it with metformin, I think it's worth giving that a try. But be wary that this woman ovulation induction is likely to fail if all those parameters fail and you're looking at quite a roller coaster ride when you do IVF with step down the only way that it works and freezing of embryos and this lady still runs a high risk of getting into at least mild or moderate open hyperstimulation even with an analog trigger. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.